Okay, so this next section I have not read. This is The Golden Finch um, by Donna Tart, chapter five. I don't know how long I was out. When I came to, it seemed as if I was flat on my stomach in a sandbox on some dark playground, some place I didn't know, a deserted neighborhood, a gang of tough, ready boys was hunched around me, kicking me in the ribs, in the back of the head. My neck was twisted to the side and the wind was knocked out of me, but that wasn't the worst of it. I had sand in my mouth. I was breathing sand. The boys muttered audibly, get up, asshole. Look at him. Look at him. He don't know dick. I rolled over and threw my arms over my head and then with an airy, surreal jolt saw that nobody was there. For a moment I lay stunned, too stunned to move. Alarm bells clanging in the muffled distance, as strange as it seems, I was under the impression that I was lying in the walled-in courtyard of some godforsaken housing project. Somebody had beat me up pretty good. I ached all over, my ribs were sore, and my head felt as if somebody had hit me with a lead pipe. I was working my jaw back and forth and reached my pocket to see if I had train fare home when it came over me abruptly that I had no clue where I was. <coughs> Stiffly, I lay there in the glowing consciousness that something had badly was out of joint. The light was all wrong, and so was the air. Acrid and sharp, and chemical fog that burned my throat. The gum in my mouth was gritty, and when head pounding. I rolled over to spit it out. I found myself blinking through layers of smoke at something so foreign. I st stared at it for some moment. I was in a white, I was in a ragged white cave. Swags and tatters dangling from the ceiling. The ground was tumbled and bucked up with heaps of gravy substance like moon rock and blown about with broken glass and gravel and a hurricane of random trash, bricks and slag and papery stuff frosted with a thin ash like first frost. High overhead, a pair of lamps beamed through off the dust like off-kilter car lights in a fog, cockeyed one angled upwards and the other rolled to the side and casting skews of shadows. My ears rang and so did my body, an intensely disturbing sensation, bones, brain, heart, all thrumming like a struck bell, faintly from somewhere far off the mechanical. A shriek of alarms rang steadily and impersonal. I could hardly tell if those noises were coming from inside or outside me. There was a strong sense of being alone in wintry deadness. Nothing made sense in any direction. In a cascade of grit, my hand on cascade of grit, my hand on some not quite vertical surface, I stood, wincing at the pain in my head. The tilt of the shape where I was had a deep, innate wrongness. On one side, smoke and dust hung in a still blanket layer. On the other, a mass of shredded materials, slain down in a tangle where the roof or the ceiling should have been. My jaw hurt, my face and knees were cut, my mouth was like sandpaper. Blinking around the chaos, I saw tennis shoes. I saw a tennis shoe. Drifts of crumbly matter, stained dark, a twisted aluminum sidewalk, walking stick. I was swaying there, choked and dizzy, not knowing where to turn or what to do, when all of a sudden I thought I heard my, a phone go off. For a moment I wasn't sure, listening hard, and then it spiraled off again, faint and draggy, a little weird, clumsily. I grabbed around in the wreckage, upending dust kitty per dusty kitty purses, a tape. Day pack, snatching my hands around, my hands back at hot things and shards of broken glass, more and more troubled by the way the rubble gave under my feet in spots and by the soft inert lumps at the edge of my vision. Even if I had become convinced I never heard a phone, that ringing in my ears had played a trick on me. And still, I kept looking and locked onto the mechanical gestures of searching with an unthinkable robot intensity among pens, handbags, wallets, broken eye glasses, hotel key cards, compacts, and perfume sprays, and prescription medications. Rodamin, Andrian, Alprazolam, 0.25 milligrams. I unearthed a keychain flashlight with a non-working phone, half charged, no bars, where I threw the clap, which I threw in a collapsible nylon shopping bag I found in some lady's purse. 
I was grasping, half choked with plaster dust. And my head hurt so badly I could hardly see. I wanted to sit down, except there was no place to sit. When I saw a bottle of water, my eyes reverted fast and straight over the havoc until I saw it again about 15 feet away, half blurred in a pile of trash. Just a hint of label, familiar shade of cold case blue. Within, with a benumbed heaviness like moving through snow, I began to slog and weave through the debris, rubbish breaking under my feet and sharp glacial crack sounding cracks. But I had not made it very far when out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement on the ground, conspicuous in the stillness of a stirring of white on white. I stopped, then I waited a few steps closer. It was a man flat on his back, a whitened head to toe with dust. He was also well camouflaged in ash powdered wreckage and that, that in a, it was a moment before his form came clear, chalk on chalk, struggling to sit up in a statue, like a statue knocked off his pedestal. As I drew closer, I saw that he was old and very frail, with the misshapen hunchback quality. His hair, what he had, was blown straight up from his head. The side of his face was stippled with ugly sprays of burns, and his, and his head above one ear was a sticky black horror. I had made it over to where he was when, unexpectedly fast, he shot out his dust-whitened arm and grabbed my hand. In panic, I started back, but he was old but he only clutched at me tighter, coughing and coughing with a sick wetness. Where? He seemed to be saying where. He was trying to look at me, but his head dangled heavily on his neck and his chin lolled on his chest so that he was forced to peer from under his brows at me like a vulture. But his eyes and the ruined face were intelligent and despairing. Oh God, I said, bending to him bending to help him, wait, wait, wait. And then I stopped not knowing what to do. His lower half lay twisted on the ground like a pile of dirty clothes. <laughs> he raised himself with his arms, gamely, it seemed, lips moving, still struggling to raise himself. He reeked of burned hair, burned wool, but the lower half of his body seemed disconnected from the upper half and he coughed and fell back in a heap. I looked around, trying to get my bearings deranged from the crack on the head. With no sense of time, or even if it was day or night, the grandeur and des desolation of the space baffled me, the high, rare loft of it layered with graduations of smoke and, billow and billowing with a tangled tent-like effect where the ceiling or the sky ought to be. But though I had no idea where I was or why, still there was half-remembered quality about the wreckage, a cinematic charge in the glare of the emergency lamps on the internet. I'd seen footage of a hotel blown up in the desert where the honeycombed rooms at the mo moment of collapse were frozen in such a blast of light. Then I remembered the water. I stepped backwards, looking all around until, with a leap of my heart, I spotted the dusty flash of blue. Look. I said, edging away. I'm just, the old man was watching me with a gaze at once hopeful and hopeless. Like a starved dog too weak to walk. No, wait, I'm coming back. Like a drunk, I staggered through the rubbish, weaving and plowing, stepping high knee over objects, muddling through bricks and concrete and shoes and handbags and a whole lot of charged bits. I didn't want to see too clearly. <laughs> The bottle was three quarters full and hot to the touch, but at the first swallow, my throat took charge and I gulped more than half of it, taste, plastic tasting, dishwater warm. Before I realized what I was doing, I forced myself to cap it and put it in the bag to take to him. Kneeling beside him, rocking, rocks digging into my knees, he was shivering, breaths rasp and uneven. His gaze didn't meet mine, but straight above, above it, fixed fretfully on something I didn't see. I was fumbling for the water when he reached his hand to my face. Carefully, his bony, flat pad fingers, he brushed the hair from my eyes and plucked a thorn of glass from my eyebrow and then patted me on the head. There, there, his voice was very faint, very scratchy, very cordial, with a ghastly pulmonary whistle. We looked at each other for a long moment. A strange moment that I'd never forget, forgotten. I actually liked two animals meeting at twilight during which some clear, personable spark seemed to fly up through his eyes, and I saw the creature 
He really was. He, I believe, saw me. For an instant, we were wired together and humming like two engineers on the same circuit. When he lolled back again, so limply, I thought he was dead. Here, I said awkwardly, slipping my hand under his shoulder. That's good. I held up his head as best I could and helped him drink from the bottle. He could only take a little, and most of it ran down his chin, again falling back at too much effort. Pip, he said thickly. I looked down at his burnt, reddened face, stirred by some familiarity in his eyes, which were rusty and clear. I had seen him before. I had seen the girl too, the briefest snapshot of him autumn leaf, lucidity, rusty eyebrows, honey brown eyes, her face was reflected in his. Where was she? He was trying to say something, cracked lips. He wanted to know where Pippa was, wheezing and gasping for breath. Here, I said, agitated. Try to lie still. She should take the train, it's so much faster, unless they bring her in a car. I don't know, I said, leaning closer, leaning closer. I wasn't worried. Someone would would be in to get us shortly. I was sure of it. I'll wait till they come. You're so kind. His hand, so cold, dry as powder, tightened on mine. I haven't seen you since you were a little boy again. You're all grown up the la since the last time we spoke. You were all grown up the last time we spoke. But I'm Theo. I said after a slightly confused pause, of course you are. His gaze, like like his hand, clasped steady and kind. And you've made a very, the very best choice, and I'm sure of it. The Mozart is so much nicer than the Gluck, don't you think? I didn't know what to say. It'd be easier, it'd be easier, the two of you. They're so hard on you children in the auditions. Coughing, lips slick with blood, thick with red. No second chances. Listen. It felt wrong letting him think I was someone. Oh, but you play it so beautifully, my dear, the pair of you. The G major, it keeps running in my mind. Lightly, lightly, touch and go, humming a few shapeless notes, a song, it was a song. And I must have told you how I went for piano lessons at the old American ladies. There was a green lizard that lived in the palm tree, green like a candy drop I love to watch for him flashing in the windowsill. Fairy lights in their garden. Toi patience. 20 minutes to walk in, but it seemed like miles. He faded in for, faded for a moment. I could feel his intelligence drifting away from me, spinning out of, out of sight like a leaf on a brook. On the brook. Then it washed back and he was there again. And there he was again. And you, how old are you now? 13. At the lycée Francie. No, my school's on the west side. And just as well, I should think. All these French classes. Too many vocabulary words for a child. Nom et pronom. Species and philium. It's only a form of insect collecting. Sorry? We always spoke French at Gruppies. Remember Gruppies? With the striped umbrella and the pistachio ices. Isis, striped umbrella. It was hard to think through my headache. My glances wandered to the long gash in his scalp, clotted and dark like an axe wound. More and more, I became aware of my dreadful body-like shapes slumped in the debris. Dark husks, not clearly seen, pressing in slightly all around us, dark everywhere, and the ragdoll bodies. Yet it was the darkness that you could drift away upon. Something sleepy about it, froth frothy wake churned and vanished like a cold black ocean suddenly something was very wrong he was awake shaking me hands flapping he wanted something he tried to press himself up on a whistling in a breath in breath what is it i said shaking myself alert he was grasping agitated and tugging at my arms fearfully i st i sat up and looked around expecting to see some fresh danger rolling in Loose wires, a fire, a ceiling about to collapse. Grasping my hands, squeezing it tight, not there. He managed to say, what? Don't leave it. No, he was glancing past me, trying to point at something. Take it away from there. Please lie down. 
No, they mustn't see it. He was frantic, gripping my arms now, trying to pull himself up. They've stolen the rugs. They'll take it to the custom, to the custom shed. He was, I saw pointing over at a dusty rectangle of broad, rectangle of, of broad, virtually invisible in the broken beams of rubbish. Smaller than my laptop computer at home. That, that, I said, looking closer. It was doppled with drips of wax and pasted with irregular patchwork of crumpled labels. That's what you want? I beg of you. He, he squeezed his eyes tight. He was upset, coughing so hard he could barely speak. I reached out and picked up the board. And picked the board up by the edges. It felt surprisingly heavy for something so small. A long splinter of broken frames clung to one corner, drawing my sleeve across the dusty frame. Tiny yellow bird, faint beneath a veil of white dust. The anatomy lesson was in the same book, actually, but it had scared the pants off. Right, I whispered drowsily. I turned, painting in hand, to show to her, and then realized she wasn't there. Or she was there and she wasn't. Part of her was there, but it wasn't invisible. But it was invisible. The invisible part was the important part. This was something that I had never understood before. But when I tried to say this out loud, the words came out in a muddle and I realized with a cough's cold slap that I was wrong. Both parents had to be together. You couldn't have one part without the other. I rubbed my arms across my forehead and tried to blink the grit from my eyes. And with a massive effort, like lifting weeds much too heavy for me, tried to shift my mind to where I needed to be. Where was my mother? For a moment, there had been three of us, and one of these, I was pretty sure, had been her. But now there were only two. Behind me, the old man had begun to cough and shudder again, with the uncontrollable urgency, trying to speak. Reaching back, I tried to hand the picture over to me here. He sa I said, and then to my mother, in the spot where she had been. I'll be back in a minute. But the painting wasn't what he wanted. Fretfully, he pushed it back to me, babbling something. The right side of his head was such a sticky drench of blood I could hardly see his ear. What? I said, my mind still on my mother. Where was she? Sorry? Take it. Look, I'll be back. I have to. I couldn't get it out. Not quite. But my mother wanted but my mother wanted me to go home immediately. She was supposed, I was supposed to meet her there. And that was the one thing that she could, that she had made very clear. Take it with you, pressing it to me. Go! He was trying to sit up. His eyes were bright and wild. His agitation frightened me. They took all, they took all the light bulbs. They've smashed up the houses in the street. The drips of blood ran down his chin. Please, I said, hands flustering, afraid to touch him. Please lie down. He shook his head and tried to say something, but the effort broke him down, hacking with a wet, miserable sound. He wiped his mouth. I saw a bright stripe, stripe of blood on the back of his hand. Somebody's come. Somebody's coming. Not sure I believed it, not knowing what else to say. He looked straight into my face, searching. some flicker of understanding and when he didn't find it he clawed to sit up again fire he said in a gargled voice the villa in madil ma adi on a taubadu he broke off coughing again red tinged froth bubbling at his nose nostrils in the midst of all that un unreality Sharon's and broken monoliths <coughs> had a dreamlike sense of having failed him. As if I bought some vital fairy tale task <coughs> through clumsiness and ignorance. Though there wasn't any visible fire anywhere in the middle of stone. I crawled over and put the painting in the nylon shopping bag just to get it out of sight because it was upsetting him. So don't worry, I said. I'll he calmed down. He put a hand on my wrist. I steady and bright, and a chill wind of unreason blew over me. I had done what I was supposed to do. Everything was going to be all right. 
I was and I was basking in the comfort of this notion. He squeezed my hand reassuringly as if we'd spoken aloud, the thought aloud. We'll get away from here. He said, I know. Wrap it in newspapers and pack it in the very bottom of the trunk, my dear, with the other curiosities. Relieved that he'd calmed down, exhausted with my headache and memories of my mother faded like a moth to a moth-like flicker, I settled down beside him and closed my eyes, feeling oddly comfortable and safe, absent, dreamy. He was rambling a bit under his breath, foreign names, sums and numbers, a few French words, but mostly English. A man was coming to look at the furniture. Abdul was in trouble for throwing stones, and yet it all made sense somehow, and I saw the palmy garden and the piano, and the piano, and the green lizard on the tree trunk as if they were pages in a photograph album. Will you be all right getting home by yourself, my dear? I remember him asking at one point. Of course. I was lying on the floor beside him, my head levels level with his rickety old breastbone so that I could hear every catch and wheeze in his breath. I take the train by myself every day. And where did you say that you were living now? His hand on my head, very gentle, the way that you'd rest your hand on the head of a dog you liked. East 57th Street. Oh yes, near Livio Adora. Well, a few blocks, Livio Adora was a restaurant where my mother had liked to go back when we had money. I'd eat my first escargot there and taste my first sip of Mar Mark at the Birch something from our glass. Towards the park, you say? No, closer to the river. Close enough, my dear. Marin, Jingerverse, and Caviar. How, oh, how I love this city the first time I saw it. Still, it's not the same, is it? I miss it all terribly, don't you? The balcony and the garden. I turn to look at him. Perfumes and melodies in my swamp of confusion. It had come to seem that he was a close friend or family member that I'd forgotten about. Some long lost relative of my mother's. Oh, your mother, darling. I'll never forget the first time she came to play. She was the prettiest little girl I ever saw. How had he known I was thinking about her? I started to ask him, but he was asleep and his eyes were closed, but his breath was fast and horse-like. He was running from something. I was fading out myself, ears ringing, insane buzz of a metallic taste in my mouth, like at the dentist. And I might have drifted back into unconsciousness and stayed there had he not at some point shaken me hard. So I woke up with a buck of panic and he was mumbling and tugging at his index finger. He'd taken his ring off, a heavy gold ring with a carved stone. He was trying to give it to me. Here, I don't want that, I said, shying away. What are you doing that for? But he pressed into my palm, his breath was bubbled and ugly. Hobart and Blackwell, he said, in a voice like he was drowning from inside out. Ring the green bell. Green bell, I repeated uncertainly. He lolled his, he lolled his head back and forth, punch drunk, lips quivered. His eyes were unfocused. When they slid over me without seeing me, they gave me a shiver. Tell Hub, Hobby to get out of the store, he said thickly. In disbelief, I watched the blood trickle from the right corner of his mouth. He loosened his tie by yanking at it. Here, I said, reaching over to help, but he batted my hands away. He's got a close register and get out, he whispered. His father's sending some guys to beat him up. His eyes rolled, his eyelids fluttered, and then he sank down into himself, flat, collapsed, looking like the air was out of him. 30 seconds, 40 like a heap of old clothes, but then so harshly I flinched, his chest swelled on a bellow-like rasp, and he coughed a percussive gout of blood that spewed all over me. As best he could, he hitched himself up on his elbows, and for 30 seconds or so, he panted like a dog, chest pumping frantically, up and down, up and down, his eyes fixed on something I couldn't see, and all the time gripping my hand like maybe he had held on tight enough, he'd be okay. Are you all right? I said, frantic, close to tears. Can you hear me? He grasped and thrashed a fish out of water. I held his head up, or tried to, not knowing how, afraid of hurting him. 
as all the time he clutched my hand like he was dangling off a building and about to fall. Each breath was an isolated, gargled heave, a heavy stone lifted with a terrible effort, and dropping again and again to the ground. At one point, he looked at me directly, blood welling in his mouth, and seemed to say something, but words were only a burble down his chin. Then, to my sudden relief, he drew calmer, quieter, his grasp on my hand loosened, melting a sense of sinking and spinning almost like he was floating on his back away from me on water. Better? I asked. And then, carefully, I dripped a bit of water on his mouth. His lips worked. I saw them moving. And then, on my knees, like a servant boy in a story, I wiped some of the blood off his face. Some of the blood off his face with a paisley squ square from his pocket as he drifted, cruelly, by degrees of latitude into stillness. I rocked back on my heels and looked hard into his wrecked face. Hello? I said. One papery eyelid, half shut, twitched. A blue veined tick. If you can hear me, squeeze my hand. But his hand was in mine was limp. I sat there, looked at him, not knowing what to do. It was time to go, well past time. My mother had made that perfectly clear, and yet I could see no path out of the space where I was. And in fact, some ways it was hard to imagine being anywhere else in the world. That there was another world outside that one. And it was like I'd never had another life at all. Can you hear me? I asked him one last time, bending close, putting my ear to his bloody mouth, but there was nothing. <gasps> Bro, that, this book is very good. It's so good, I'm loving it, you guys. Okay, so, chapter six, another time. I'm really high and I'm getting hungry. Um, tell me if you're enjoying this reading during the rainstorm. I know that was like a 40 minute, just kind of like exercise. Um, but I don't want to make uh, lazy content for you guys. I want to try to do something that puts forth effort. And honestly, reading to me is not much effort. I love to read. So if you're enjoying this book, continue with me. Um, we're on page 40 now, chapter six. Next time, it'll be really good. See you later.